Um, good morning and thank you very much. Uh, huge thanks to Sunlight once again, uh, continuing to get the right people in the room. I, I love the vibe here when it's a combination of people that, uh, people that code and people that write policy. So uh, one moment here. So this is, uh, this is a real privilege to get to represent some of the private sector. Uh, it's interesting open data, just f also followed by Google. This is kind of an interesting trend going on here. Um, it's obvious. There, there is no contradiction between being a for-profit company and investing in open data. Quite the opposite. And what I want to speak to today is how, how a company like, like Mapbox actually leverages open data, both in terms of working with open data communities, but also uh, leveraging large sets of government open data. Uh, and you know, the main takeaway, I hope, is that folks in this room can figure out ways to do really neat strategic partnerships with folks in the private sector, because there's a lot of uh, leverage, t whether it's team energy, Google mentioned multiple times, we are here to help you, uh, or whether it's financial resources. And if we can better collaborate as a, as a community, we can get more done. Uh, just to frame all this, uh, as mentioned, uh, at Mapbox, we, we make tools for uh, developers to make custom maps. So, you know, if you're looking for a coffee this morning on, on Foursquare, that's, uh, you know, those results are being put on top of our map, or, you know, Pinterest, they wanted to have a big, a big really clean, uh, clean font and uh, um, bold map. Uh, when the Financial Times wanted to show where the nuke plants were in Iran, they used our cloudless satellite uh, data. Uh, GitHub was able to roll out Mapbox across 10 million plus repos and 100 lines of code. Every single map you just saw was from 100% open data. Now, interesting part here is um, why, why, are, why am I here in DC? It's not just because of Transparency Camp. We, we, we started here. Uh, and Mapbox actually grew out of a company called Development Seed that was doing a lot of international development consulting work. And Development Seed uh, still does m incredible work mapping uh, malaria in Africa to doing a lot of election work. And this is a project I got to be involved in, in uh, about four and a half years ago, right when, uh, and really was the birth of Mapbox. This, was, this is what a data API looked like for the uh, Afghanistan election in uh, 2009. And just to frame how an election works, again, following up on, on voting. Um, in Afghanistan, you got to get the ballots there. This is your data creation event. Uh, you get the ballots back. You get a PDF that gets you the president. The problem is in this PDF, right? You can't see what's going on. This is the front page of a 2,500-page uh, uh, PDF. What we needed to do is we needed to rip the data out to do basic queries. Let me see where there's 100% ballot submission. Let me see where there's 95% voter turnout. Let me do some other basic things like, hey, let me break down top votes between Abdullah and Karzai and throw them on top of uh, an, an ethnic overlay map. Let me look at the security results in southern Ghazni. All right, is there a correlation there between some of the fraud criteria that we were just running? Uh, pan over a little. Next thing you know, you're seeing there's voting in enemy-controlled territory. Is that good? Is that bad? Um, it's not really a point. The point is that now uh, in-country experts and uh, election observers that don't do like GIS stuff are able to actually look at data. That's really where we fit in as a, as, as, a, as a platform company. We put tools out there to let you work with data, design data, and then, and then publish that. What makes us very different than some of the traditional incumbents is that we're doing this all with open source and open data. And I really want to make some of these examples uh, pretty, pretty concrete today. So first, uh, we work with OpenStreetMap. This, uh, this is a community of folks that's often, often described as the Wikipedia of maps. What's really interesting here is this number, 1.5 million community members. Last month, 20,000 people added data to this map, people on the ground knowing what's important to map in their own neighborhood. This is incredibly powerful. And all those maps you just saw were powered by labels of OpenStreetMap. What's the name of the town? What's the name of the road? And over, uh, over the years, uh, special thanks to the Knight Foundation. Uh, Knight, and people, everybody in the room looking to do something cool should keep an eye on Knight Foundation. They, um, they invest in the non-sexy part of sexy projects, is how, kind of how I think about it. And they, they gave us significant resources to build out a new tracing interface for OpenStreetMap where you can go in and look at satellite imagery of a road and be able to put that on the map or go in and draw a building. 
And the impact that this starts having, this isn't just about showing where to find pork chops in San Francisco or, or bacon and whiskey on, on Pinterest like I just showed. I mean, this is being used in, in real time. I mean, look back two months ago to the Ebola outbreak. This was affecting people that weren't on the map. This is one of the few satellite images of, uh, of one of the cities uh, most affected. In a, in a matter of a day, the humanitarian OpenStreetMap team uh, spun up an action, uh, called action, and people started coming and adding data to the map. Cities were traced overnight, and Doctors Without Borders was using that data in real time daily to help better administer services. So you start having this ecosystem where it's almost like you know, OpenStreetMap's a bad name for the project. It's like OpenStreet Data. The point was Doctors Without Borders was able to get access to that and use it for their own logistic support. Um, you know, a, a, a company like Foursquare is able to leverage that to have beautiful custom maps. Um, but because the data is open, you can do anything with it. And that's really, this is radically different than at any other point in history where, where data has been locked up in proprietary uh, uh, formats. Um, and I want to now kind of uh, transition from more raw uh, vector data to, uh, to, to raster data, specifically on the imagery side. There's a lot happening in, uh, in the larger space uh, of satellite imagery. You're hearing a lot about these microsatellites, these from shoebox size to small dorm room refrigerator size uh, satellites going up that can start observing the Earth uh, in, in, in near real time. Uh, the interesting part is not the camera optics. It's the software to be able to process that. So, I want to walk through uh, a couple satellite sensors very quickly. One, uh, this is this is a classic uh, classic shot from the MODIS sensor on Terra and Aqua satellite by by NASA, and they, they put this out um, every day. In fact, you can have a full world shot twice a day. That's incredibly powerful. Now, if you're making a map, the problem here is those clouds, right? So what we do is we take thousands of images, going back multiple times a day every day for years and stack them all up. And then we're able to spin up thousands of servers to run an algorithm to filter. And then we throw away the white spot. So it kind of becomes this cube, right? And then on a pixel by pixel basis, we're able to run an algorithm looking for the best pixel all the way back and slam it together into one single mosaic. This is the, a perfect summer day everywhere in the world. So yeah, we took uh, environmental uh, sensors from NASA uh, and made a completely artificial product. And it's, it's absolutely beautiful. There are no clouds in Vancouver today. Um, but it's more than just uh, being beautiful. Uh, this is what cows look like from, from space. That's not a seam. That's actually an international boundary. You can see different land use. Uh, why is our Australia so red? You can really see things happening here. And what's, what's interesting about this is this, is this is traditionally a very hard operation to do. Doing atmospheric correction at scale is, is really complicated. Um, so I thought I'd show a graph that really explains how, how easy this is. Um, we're, we're a team of just a few people in, uh, in a garage in Washington, D.C. We're just over 50 people right now, and a team out in San Francisco. And I'm able to take real-time imagery from space and process it because I'm able to leverage cloud resources. Uh, this graph might not make a lot of sense, but this one will. So we're able to write algorithms ac across a giant cluster. So it starts off down here. We're running about 300 servers at this point. And the algorithm's not really working as fast as we want to on the kind of server type. Well, we're able to swap out the entire server type, increase the amount of RAM on it. We start killing it. We start going up so much and turning on so many servers that we actually affect the prices locally for Amazon because we're buying it all in the spot market. You can buy excess cloud compute resources. So we shut them down, wait for the price to adjust, and then finish the processing job. This is incredibly powerful when you're able to leverage thousands of servers on the fly like this. So let me show you what this looks like. This is the next version of Cloudless Atlas that we'll be uh, releasing in the next couple weeks. Again, this is all from uh, open data because the US government puts it out under public domain. And this is really important. A company like myself is able to create jobs 
using data because it's not like a sh there's no share alike license with this. I can do whatever I want with this. These are our maps. We own these. These are copywritten map box. Um, and that's, that's important as you're thinking about opening up your data. There's a lot of people uh, influencing policy. People do not give back because of a license. They give back because of a community and they give back because tech enables them to. Uh, share alike does not uh, create incentives to give back. It creates disincentives for uh, enterprise and uh, business to actually become involved in, uh, in a project. So uh, again, this is, this is all totally open data, all, all, from, uh, all from NASA. So let me, um, let me just stop there. Uh, I just want to give you a really concrete example of how, uh, of how data is able to be, to be leveraged and start giving you a sense of how people in this room should start talking to other businesses in the space about how we can combine resources, whether that's collaborating through communities uh, like OpenStreetMap uh, in, in the case of geodata or you know, working with this public-private partnership space um, like between NASA and us. Um, there, there's a lot of neat things going on right now. And this is, slide is just a shameless plug. Um, we're growing uh, and we're absolutely looking for awesome people to help come and code and especially, uh, especially women. Cheers.